All right, if you have your Bible this evening, turn with us, if you will, to Psalm 80. Psalm 80, we talked a little bit, it's not the subject of the message tonight, but we talked a little bit about prayer Sunday, and the preachers say this week that it used to be when you had a prayer meeting, the prayer request would be that the Lord would convict sinners and that so-and-so would be saved and so-and-so that I'm witnessing to would be saved and that so-and-so would be saved. And now all the prayer requests is that God's people would actually come to church and be faithful. And that's about where we are in this Laodicean church day. It's a mess, amen. All right, Psalm 80. We are moving through these psalms. And the introduction to this psalm says to the chief musician, and uh, this is included in 55 of the psalms to the chief musician. He was the minister of worship and the leader of the sacred psalms at the tabernacle and then the temple. So this was a psalm or song that was to be sung when they gathered for national worship. It says to the chief musician, and I will probably butcher this word, Shoshanam Edith. Now, the commentaries offer very little information concerning what this may be, and the information that they do offer varies greatly. Uh, some believe, the majority believe that it means lily of a testimony, or by extension, a beautiful testimony of Christ. And I think we are fairly certain that no one knows exactly what it means at all. If I could guess, I would say that it's probably, from all the information that I've read, some type of musical instrument. It is, again, a psalm of Asaph. We have been looking at several of those. And so this psalm is one of intercession. It is also a plea for deliverance by Asaph on behalf of Israel. Uh, the apex of the psalm is found in verse 18, where the psalmist vows repentance and dedication on behalf of Israel. This psalm is a psalm of rebuke, a psalm of repentance, and a psalm of restoration on the part of Israel. And so our desire for this psalm, as it has been uh, for the last few psalms, will be to find some exhortation or some admonition that can benefit those of us who are saved and enjoying the grace and mercy of God in the day in which we live. So we do know that this is to uh, Israel, but I mentioned, I think it was the last Wednesday night, that in all Scripture uh, we can find help, we can find something, we can find, uh, I, I think the Scripture says in Corinthians, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. That's actually in Timothy. But we can learn something from their examples, what the book of Corinthians talks about. And so we'll pray together. I'm going to read the psalm. There's only 19 verses to the psalm. I'll read the psalm. We'll pray together and ask the Lord to help us this evening. The Bible says in verse number 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh stir up thy strength and come and save us. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen, and planted it. Thou preparest room before it, and didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the bras thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her bras into the sea, and her branches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. 
Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts, look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. And the vineyard, vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou makest strong for thyself, it is burned with fire, it is cut down, they perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man, whom thou madest strong for thyself. So will we not go back from thee, quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the opportunity to be in the house of the Lord on a Wednesday afternoon. So glad, Lord, we can sing together the praises of the Lord and the great hymns of faith. Thankful, Lord, that we can pray together and pray for each other. And I pray, Lord, for the many requests that were mentioned in the men's prayers group and also the ladies, I'm sure. And then, Lord, no doubt, numerous requests upon each of our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would meet the needs of the people. And Lord, as we've come to the preaching time of the service this afternoon, I do need your help. I pray you'd use me, Lord, to be a blessing and a help to God's people. And Lord, pray you'd give us wisdom and understanding, help us to speak the truth in love, help us to say those things which are pleasing to you, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing we see in the first four verses of this psalm is we see a penitent prayer for mercy. First of all, the Bible says in verse number one, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, and thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. So this psalm begins right away with a plea for God to hear. And I promise you, any time that we find ourselves in the shape that the children of Israel is in in this psalm, we certainly want God to hear us. The psalmist starts out by describing our great God, and he does that in three different ways. He says, O shepherd of Israel. And then he made mention that this God was the one who led Joseph like a flock. And then he makes mention of the fact that it is he who dwelt between the cherubs. Now we understand that this one that dwelt between the cherubs it refers to or offers a description or refers to uh, the earthly presence of God in the tabernacle upon the mercy seat. And so the prayer of Asaph here is going to boil down to a prayer for God to hear, and not only for God to hear, but also for God to shine forth or for God to, uh, undoubtedly this shining forth re refers to His glory and the psalmist is saying, if you can help us, if you can turn us again, if you can get us out of this situation that we're in, it will certainly bring forth glory to God. And so they want the Lord to hear. The psalmist wants God to hear. He wants Him to shine forth. And truly, God remains our shepherd, and we are the sheep of His pastor. And the children of Israel here, even though they're in the shape that they're in, the psalmist here, he understands that he is still the shepherd of Israel. He is still the one that leads, and He is still the one that has mercy. And I'm glad that the Lord is our shepherd, amen, in spite of the fact that we get ourselves in messes oftentimes. I'm glad He doesn't cease to be our shepherd. And sometimes we find ourselves in bad places and bad situations. I'm glad that God is a merciful God. And I'm glad He doesn't resign from leading us or He doesn't resign from uh, being our shepherd, doesn't design from be resign from being merciful unto us. What a great God. And so I'm glad for the mercy seat of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's our prayer and answers them. Verse number two he mentions three names. He said, Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. Now, you should recognize these names and you understand the names here. All of these individuals that are mentioned are kin. Ephraim and Manasseh are brothers. They are sons of Joseph. Benjamin is Joseph's brother, his full brother. They have the same mother. Rachel is their mother. She's the favorite wife of Jacob. And so these three are Minchan. And during Asaph's time, during Asaph's day, writing this psalm, they represented the major divisions of Israel. Ephraim, as we have studied before, represented the northern tribes of Israel, the northern section of Israel. 
And Benjamin was allied with Judah, represented the southern nations or the southern section of Israel, if you will. And so the thought here of this psalmist is not, it's not just one, it's not just the northern tribe, it's not just Ephraim, and it's not just Judah, the southern tribe. All of Israel is in great need of the help of the Lord. We no longer desire to be divided into nations. All of us have great need of you being our shepherd. We all have great need of you being our leader. We all have great need of you being a merciful God unto us. And so Asaph is pleading not for one group or the other, but for the entire nation of Israel and his cry, his plea is very simple. Come and save us. You see that at the end of verse number two? And come and save us. This salvation here is not a spiritual salvation. It referred to God's deliverance. His people are being chastened. They've been turned over to another nation. And they're, they're in all kinds of trouble because of this chastisement. And he is speaking of salvation or deliverance from this chastening hand of God that is upon them at this time. Now here at the writing of this psalm, and we'll read about it in several places here, in 2 Chronicles and also Kings in just a few minutes. But here, here's what I want you to understand. At the time of the writing of this psalm, the Egyptians had invaded, they had overran Israel, and the psalmist is pleading with God from, for deliverance from this, from this cruel nation and for the chastisement was, was upon them. And so here, preacher, what, what can we get from that? What is in that devotional for us? How can we see a need in, this, in these verses of Scripture that God can help us? Well, the lesson for you and I today remains the same. When Christ is, that Christ is coming in our lives, we ought to run to Him for deliverance. In all of our circumstances and in all of our situations in life, we should never run from God. We should always run to God. When we've been disobedient, we should not run away from God. We should run to God. When we're being chastened by the Lord, it's not a good thing to run from Him. We should run to Him. And remembering during all of those times, even when God is chasing us, that He is still our shepherd. He is still our leader. He is still a merciful God and he still cares about us as individuals. What a blessing. Now look at verse number three. Verse number three, the psalmist said, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Now, this is the first of three times. I don't know if you noticed it when I was reading the psalm. Sometimes you don't when you just read through it one time. Read the psalm many times. But Psalm 3, Psalm, uh, verse number 3, verse number 7, verse number 19, they're almost verbatim. And uh, there could be several reasons for this. I, I believe that this is a song. It is a song that's going to be sung by the nation of Israel in congregational worship. And maybe this is the chorus. It is certainly the main theme of the psalm. And maybe this is the chorus of the song. And so uh, he says, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Now, turn us again. It has the thought of bringing back, or maybe it is the idea of restoring us. We have, we have turned away from God. Would you turn us again towards you? Would you cause your glory, your face to shine upon us again? And it seems to be the theme of the psalm. So the psalmist here, he is putting a New Testament verse into practice long before the New Testament was ever written, and that's Hebrews 4, 16, where the Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. And so the psalmist recognizes the need of Israel, and so he's begging God to turn them again, and not just to turn them again, but that God's blessing and God's face would shine upon them again, and that they would be saved. They want God's grace to shine upon them again. And I'll tell you, it would be a blessed deliverance to be delivered from the hand of an oppressive enemy. And so though we as New Testament Christians are in somewhat of a different relationship with God than Israel is, we understand that. We know that uh, Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel. But I'm glad that you and I can still come to God pleading to Him, pleading His grace and mercy in the time of need. And that's what the psalm is about. 
Now look at verse number four. O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? And so Israel has turned back on God. Hold your place here and come to 2 Chronicles for just a second. Israel has turned their back on God. I'll show you from the Bible why Israel is in the shape that they are in at the time of the writing of this psalm. And in case I forget to tell you later, hold your place in 2 Chronicles. Later in the sermon, we're going to come back and read some more verses from here. But I just want to show you this. The Psalm 80, verse number 4 that we just read says, O Lord God of hosts, how long will thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? I want to show you why God is angry. Look at 2 Chronicles 12. Look at verse number 5. <clears throat> then came Shimei the prophet to Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem. Because Shishak had said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Ye have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. And so because Israel has turned their back on God, he in turn was chastening them as a faithful father chastens disobedient children. And so it must have been a lengthy period of time because Asaph in our psalm, back in Psalm 80, is praying and asking how long will God's anger continue against them. I'll tell you, sometimes our chastening is longer than, of course, any chastening for you and I is longer than we think is necessary. But sometimes our chastening is longer than, than we can endure. Sometimes it seems to be longer than... We're able to bear. So the psalmist here, he is pleading with God. He is asking him, how long is he going to be angry with the prayer of thy people? Well, I don't want God to be angry with me. I sure don't want God to be angry towards the prayer of, our, of, my, of, of my prayer. Amen, I'll tell you that. And so I praise the Lord that God hears and answers our, the prayer of the penitent. So in those first four verses, we see this prayer for mercy. Now, in verses 4 and 5, we see a positive statement concerning the rebuke that they received. Look at verse number 5. Verse number 5 says, Thou feedest them with bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. And so the season of rejoicing has turned into great sorrow. The psalmist here begins to tell us the affliction that the people of Israel are enduring, the, the harshness of their chastisement, the harshness of the punishment that they're receiving under this uh, evil nation that has them captive. And it says, Thou feedest them with the bread of tears and givest them tears to drink in great measure. And so their food and their drink are tears. All of their nourishment seems that everything that they about their lives is just associated with tears. There's, there is great sorrow and the sorrow is in great measure. And verse number six says, Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors and our enemies laugh among themselves. And so here the children of Israel are. They are full of trouble. They're full of sorrow. This trouble is staring them in the face. And if, if that's not enough, this, this suffering that they're going through, the trouble that they're facing, uh, their neighbors are making fun of them. Their enemies are laughing at them. And so they have all this calamity going on in their lives. Their, their lives are just full of brokenness, full of sorrow. And there's no one to have pity. There's no one to have mercy. Their neighbors are not offering help. There's, there's a strife between them and their neighbors. Their, their friends are not offering companionship. Their enemies are laughing at them. They're just, they're just in a horrible mess. And so the psalmist is pleading on behalf of God to help them. And I'll tell you, if we ever get any help in any kind of situation, it'll be because the Lord sees fit to help us. And it'll be because God has mercy upon us who does not deserve His mercy. Israel has not done anything to deserve the help of God. They haven't deserved, done anything to deserve God to turn us again. But I'm glad that God is a faithful and a just and a righteous and a holy and a merciful God. Amen. And so we see, we see the reason for their rebuke or the, the chastisement that they're receiving. And it, is, and it is certainly a fierce 
and horrible thing. Then we see verse number seven is the repeat of verse number three that we, that we mentioned earlier. And here is a, uh, just a pitiful review of the past, beginning in verse number seven. It says, Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. I mentioned earlier, I'll mention again, I'll mention it one more time when we get down to the verse. The psalmist here repeats the basic theme of this psalm, or the chorus, if you will. I would consider this the chorus of the psalm. He pours out the need for help, and then he shows why they need help, and then his plea is once again to turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine so that we shall be saved. Now look at verse number 8. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt and hast cast out the heathen and planted it. So the psalmist is going to begin to use the metaphor of a vine and share his heart with God about what he has done for them and what God has done with the nation of Israel and then the condition that they're in now. And the psalmist is going to lay all of this out in preparation for his request for God later on in verse number 14. And so he says here that uh, thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Now, I want to show you, hold your, hold your place here, and I want to show you more about this great truth in Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. Talking about this vine, which is Israel, being brought out of Egypt. And being planted, what well, the Bible says here in Isaiah chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it, and also made a winepress therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up. And break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. And I will lay it waste, and it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns." I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. And he looked for judgment, but behold oppression, for righteousness, but behold a cry. So what we've just read in Isaiah chapter 5 is some detail concerning our Psalm 80 and what has happened to the nation of Israel. They have been planted. They have, were supposed to be a fruitful vine. I like what the Bible says here in verse number, uh, verse number 4. He said, What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? He, in other words, the Lord's saying, I've done absolutely everything possible. There's nothing else that could have been done for you to be a fruitful vine, for you to bring forth fruit that is pleasing to God. And yet you have not brought forth grapes. You have brought forth wild grapes. And so there's some of the reason behind what's going on with Israel at this time. The Lord has brought them out. He's planted them. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. But I want to say this. What more could God have done for you and I? Amen. He, he came to this earth. 
And uh, he lived without sin. He died without sin. They placed him in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he got up victorious over death, hell, and the grave. He, we're, we're not saved by good works. We're, uh, we're not saved by knowledge. We're saved by grace through faith. He's made it so simple that a child can understand. All he's asked us to do is to understand that we're a sinner and we're in need of a Savior. And we'll place our faith and our trust in him. He'll give us a brand new life. We'll be born again the family of God we become a child of God uh, we have everlasting life we have eternal what more could he have done for us he saved us and he planted us and yet we bring forth wild grapes no wonder no wonder the Lord is angry now come back to verse number 9 Psalm 80 verse number 9 same thing happened to the children of Israel so many times it happened in our own lives Look what he said in verse number 9, Psalm 80. Thou preparest room before it, and didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. So through the providence of God, Israel has been successful in removing the pagan nations when they moved in. And they occupied, that at one time occupied the promised land, and now God has given them the land. They've taken root therein, and they began to grow Verse number 10 says the hills were covered with the shadow of it and the brawls thereof were like goodly cedars. So the metaphor here is that the branch is as big as good sized trees. That word brawls, if I'm saying it right, is a, they are tree branches, especially of the large type or maybe even the main branch of the tree. And so the, what, the, what the scripture is telling us here, what the psalmist is telling us here, is that God has established them in the, round, in the land. It's no little uh, sapling. It's no little sprig. It is a, it is a branch. It is a broad that is, a, that is as goodly or as big or as strong or as, as robust as goodly cedars are. And so they are well rooted in the land. They are real, well established in the, in the land. They became a mighty nation under the leadership of David and Solomon. They're well grounded and well rooted in the land. But something happened to them. And sometimes I'm afraid that we as God's people, we've been brought forth, we've been planted, we've been established. God has blessed us. He's allowed us to grow. He's, he's allowed us to uh, reach a place of uh, spiritual um, uh, something, some kind of spiritual satisfaction maybe. I don't know, but it seems like God begins to bless and things are going good and things are going great and all of a sudden we decide we don't need God anymore and we begin to turn away from Him and turn our back on. That's the same thing the nation of Israel is doing. And they're in a mess because of it. And if you and I find ourselves in that place, we'll be in a mess as well. Now, he goes on in, in uh, verse number 11. He, he tells more about these vines, these branches. She sent out her broads unto the sea and her branches unto the river. So continuing with this metaphor of the vine, Asaph reminds God how Israel has expanded beyond their own little uh, initial spot. They have, they, have, they have spread their influence from the Mediterranean Sea all the way to the Euphrates. River. And the point that Asaph is trying to make here is that God has taken Egypt out or taken Israel out of Egypt. He has planted them in their land. He has blessed them. He has prospered them. And he, Asaph is building his case because of the presentation that he's going to give God here in the next few verses. He said, he said, listen, Lord, you done this. You delivered them. You brought them out. You planted them. You blessed them. They were able to prosper. They, they have expanded their borders from the, from the sea even to the river. They're, they're well established. They're well known. They're well settled. They, they have a large name. They have a, a, a great reputation. But things are changing because the Lord has taken away their, their hedges and God is going to take away their defense. And I'll read why that happened to you from another place in just a moment. So here's Asaph's question in verse number 12. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? And so Asaph's question to God was simple. 
Why have you allowed the nation that you planted? Why have you allowed the nation that you blessed? Why have you allowed the nation that you restored? Why have you allowed that nation to now be destroyed? Why, why are you allowing these other nations to rob our vines? That's the meaning of the end of verse number 12 where it says, All they which pass by that way do pluck her. And so she's just being destroyed. She's been devastated without. Verse number 13, look what it says. The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. And so not only are the nations, have the other nations been allowed to destroy Israel and to take away her fruitfulness, the boar and the wild beast are also wasting or devouring it. Now, I understand that this could very well uh, be a, a metaphor as well. It could very well be speaking of the uh, king, the conquering king Shishak that we read just a little bit about earlier. And uh, we'll read some more about it in, in, in 2 Kings or 1 Kings 14 here in just a moment. And so it could be literal that the wild beasts were also devouring their fruitfulness. I wouldn't have any problem with that at all whatsoever. But it could also be a reference to the destruction that the king, the conquering king, is of oppressing the land as well. Come to 2 Kings chapter 14. I want to read about this again in 2 Kings chapter 14, and we'll get quite a bit more information. And then we're going to go back to that 2 Chronicles chapter 12, where I asked you to hold your place just a moment ago, and I didn't. 2 Kings chapter 14, look what the Bible says in verse 25. 2 Kings 14, verse 25. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them into the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And so it was, when the king went into the house of the Lord, that the guard bare them, and brought them back into the guard chamber. And so we read again here a little bit about this uh, Shashak, the king of Egypt, how that he came against Jerusalem, and he took away all their treasures. Now come back to Second Chronicles chapter 12 here. Asaph's point is simple. Oh God, you have allowed such destruction. Why have you allowed such destruction to your people? After you delivered them, after you planted them in the land, after you blessed them the way that you have, why have you removed the hedges? Why have you removed the fences? Why have you allowed such desolation and such destruction to the people of Israel? Well, the answer is found right here. Second Chronicles chapter 12, look at verse number 1. And it came to pass, when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, look what it says, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. So Rehoboam, he, he established the kingdom, he strengthened himself, and then he forsook the law of God. And when he forsook the law of God, all of Israel forsook the law of God with him. Look at verse number two. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. Here's why. Because they had transgressed against the Lord. With 1,200 chariots and threescore thousand horsemen, and the people were without number that came with him out of Egypt. The Lubans, the Sakaeans, and the Ethiopians. And he took the fenced cities which pertained to Judah and came to Jerusalem. Then came Shimei, the prophet to Rehoboam, and the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem, because Shishak said unto them, Thus saith the Lord, You have forsaken me, and therefore have I also left you in the hand of Shishak. And so the Lord allowed these things to happen to Israel because they forsook the law of the Lord, because they transgressed against the Lord, and because they forsook the Lord. And because of that, the Lord has allowed them to be taken captive, conquered by the king of Egypt. And so they are under his hand at this time. They're, they're in a mess, amen. 
Now, here's a lesson for you and I that are Christians today. God has established us. We are the branches. We have been richly blessed. God's blessed us beyond measure. We have been fruitful. God is good to us. God has been good to us. However, we can't become complacent and apathetic. We can't, we can't grow weary of the law of God. We can't grow weary of the ways of God. We can't forsake the Lord. We can't begin trespassing against the things of God just because we've been blessed and just because God's been good to us and just because God has done great things for us in the past. It's no time to quit on the Lord. I'm afraid, I mentioned before I started a preaching about the, the prayer of, of today. It's not much prayer about people who are lost and people that need to be saved. It seems the prayer is for the sick. And, and if I get sick, I want you to pray for me. And, and the prayer is about uh, God's people. They're no longer faithful. People want, people want him to come to church. And that, that ain't even serving the Lord. That's coming to, to fellowship and rejoice and worship together about the things of God. We're, we're just, in a, just in a horrible mess. And you say, well, I, what happens when that happens? We're reading about it. It happened to the children of Israel. God done everything for them. And God's done everything for us. And it seems the more that He blesses and the, and the more that He's good to us, the more people who are turning to the things of this world instead of turning to the Lord. I tell you, if, if, we, if we become complacent and apathetic, God will allow us to be destroyed and devoured by our enemies. And I can tell you what our enemies are. Our enemies are the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we'll, we're just being a mess. So we need, we need the help of the Lord. We need to keep our eyes upon the Lord and the things of God. Now let's look quickly at these last verses here, beginning in verse 14. The psalmist now turns his plea to asking God for a demonstration of his power. They need help. In verse number 14, he says, Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. <laughs> so the psalmist is pleading with God. He began the psalm pleading with God to hear. He's pleading with God to return when we get to verse 14. And his presence has been here before, and, we, and we've missed that presence greatly. We want God to return. Can I say this? As a Christian, if you've ever enjoyed the presence of the Lord in your life, and you've been through a season in your life where the Lord didn't seem to be present, I know, now listen, I understand New Testament Christianity, that God would never leave us, never forsake us. I, I get all that. But there's been times in your life where you wondered where God was at. And it wasn't because God moved, it was because you moved. It was because we get ourselves in a situation that even though God has saved us, God's planted us, God's established us, God's blessed us, God's broadened us, He's done everything in the world for us, and we become complacent and get to think, get, get our mind on something else. Our flesh gets to lusting after something else. The world presents something that looks a lot more uh, desirable, and pretty soon we're just in a mess, and we're saying, God, would you please return? And that's, that's the plea from Asaph here in verse 14. And uh, so they, they're begging God to return. Please be merciful to the vine. Of course, Israel is the vine. Notice, notice what he said. Return, we beseech thee. So it's not just Asaph, the, the uh, psalmist. It is we, the psalmist and the people. And they're beseeching. They're begging God, the God of hosts. We'll talk about that in a minute. And so when we sin and when we are rebellious towards the Lord, we too desire God's presence to return. Look at verse 15. And the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branch that thou madest strong for thyself. And so the psalmist doesn't just want the Lord to return, as we mentioned earlier. He wants the Lord to return, and he wants the blessings of the Lord to return as well. They one time enjoyed the blessings of the Lord, and they are desiring that those blessings of the Lord return. And I'll tell you, the desire of the backslidden Christian is, is to be returned to the place of blessing as well. It, it is a, it is a I, I understand that uh, it is, uh, it ain't all about feeling, it ain't all about emotion. I get all of that. But I, I, I absolutely love it when I can feel the presence of God and He stirs my heart and I become emotional towards the Lord and the things of God. And so Israel, they're, they're desiring God to return and they're desiring the blessings of the Lord to return as well. 
Now in verse 16, he, he, he shows us a little bit about the condition that they're in. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish at the rebuke of thy countenance. So Asaph knew why they were being judged. It is God's chastening hand against them that they're being judged. And that's certainly something we know well from Hebrews chapter 12, uh, verses 1 through, or verses 5 through 11, somewhere around there about the chastening hand of God. The Lord chastens those that He loves. He loves the nation of Israel. He's chastening them because they have forsaken His law. They have transgressed against God. They've gone away from the things of the Lord. And He's chastening them. And when God chastens us, it, it makes us wise to never want to experience that again, to never want to go through that again. And I've been chastened by the Lord time and time again, and there's not been a single time that I enjoyed it. I'm thankful that He chastens me. It allows me to know that I am His and He's mine. But I certainly do not enjoy the chastening hand of God. And Israel is certainly not enjoying the chastening hand of the Lord. Verse 17, it says, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the Son of Man whom thou madest strong for thyself. Obviously, the man that he's referring to here is Israel. He's the man of the right hand. And Asaph here is asking God not just to hear and not just to return and not just to bless, but he wants God's hand to be upon them again. In other words, he wants to fellowship with God. Have you ever enjoyed the hand of God upon your life? Have you ever enjoyed the blessings of the Lord upon your life? It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. You, you, uh, you get used to that. You enjoy that. And when that's removed and when that's taken away, you're in a mess. And so Israel is in that condition and they're desiring to have that fellowship. And as a believer, if you've ever fellowshiped with God and that fellowship has been broken, you too desire to be restored to that fellowship. I want God's hand to be upon us. Look at verse 18. So will not we go back from thence, quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. So Asaph here, he, he makes a vow, he makes a promise. If God will restore them, Asaph promises that Israel will never go back from following him again. They said, so will we not go back from thee. And then, and then he, he says something interesting. He says, quicken us. Now, quicken means to be made alive. We know that. And so he says, quicken us. So make us alive again. Can I tell you something? Being out of fellowship with God will cause you to seem as a dead man or to be like a dead man. Israel is a great desire and in great need of God's blessing and God's hand and God's fellowship. And so the, he, the, he, he asked the Lord, he says, quicken us and we will call upon thy name. Now, let's look at this last verse and I want to mention several things about it and we'll be done. Here's the, here's the third time we've seen this verse. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. So this is the third time that we've seen this great verse, the theme or the chorus, if you will, of this song. Now notice the progression. I want to show you something. Look at verse number three. Turn us, O God. Look at verse number seven. Turn us again, O God of hosts. Now look at verse 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. So each time, the psalmist got more personal. He said, turn us again, O God. And then he said, turn us again, O God of hosts. You're not just the God of the people here upon the earth. You're the God of hosts. You're the God of heaven and earth. And then I, I, really, I, I really like what he says in verse number 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. He's not just God. And He is not only the God of hosts, He is our God. Lord, He is our Lord God of hosts. Lord, it's, it's a personal relationship. He's my Lord. He's, he's my God. He's my Savior. He is God. He is a great God. He is the God of hosts. He's the Almighty, but He's our Lord. O oh, Lord God of hosts, turn again and save us. I'll tell you, we, we need the Lord. Amen.
The children of Israel are in great, great need of God's help. And you and I are continually in great need of God's help. Amen. Father, thank you for the Bible, for the opportunity to read a psalm and just make a comment or two about the verses. Lord, so many times I have found myself, sadly, in the condition that Israel finds themselves in in this psalm. I'm glad that when I call upon the name of the Lord, I'm glad that you hear, and I'm glad that you have mercy. I'm glad you pity us, and you move in our direction. Lord, you promised us if we would draw nigh unto you, that you would draw nigh to us. It is obvious from the psalm that the Asaph and the people were drawing nigh to God in hopes that you would draw nigh to them. I'm thankful for that great promise in the Bible. Lord, I, I desire your touch. I, I long for fellowship with you. I enjoy the blessing that we receive only from being in fellowship with the Lord. Thank you for loving us, Lord, and being merciful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you so much for coming and being with us this afternoon.